This is the state of South Australia. In 2007, almost all of its power came from coal and gas. Today, 75% comes from solar and wind. This has been one of the fastest energy transitions of anywhere on Earth. Today, we're going to look at what they did, how they did it, if we can copy them, and if we should copy them. Maybe your time is up. South Australia has some amazing geography for renewable power. It's in the Roaring 40s, which is an area of the world with high winds. And just like the rest of Australia, it's got huge amounts of sun and huge amounts of low density land to put all the solar and wind farms in. South Australia also benefits by being part of the Australian national energy market, which isn't national. It should really be called the East Coast energy market. Nonetheless, this allows South Australia to import and export power, which can be really useful with the kind of weather dependence you get from renewable. It effectively acts like storage, which we will talk about later. There are currently two high voltage links connecting South Australia to Victoria, and a third one connecting it to both New South Wales and Victoria being built right now. The South Australian portion of that is already finished, and it comes out of this substation behind me. South Australia also has a market of just under 2 million people. This is an advantage, but it's not so small that it's incomparable to other grids. South Australia has also benefited from an extremely friendly political climate for renewables. In Australia, generally, the Labour Party is more pro-renewable. They've been in power for South Australia for all but three years, since 2002. So that's why it happened here. Now let's talk about what happened. Starting with... About half the houses here have rooftop solar. You can zoom into any block in Adelaide and check. About 20% of power generated in the state last year was from rooftop solar. This is helped by both national and state level incentives. For a standard system, you get about half the cost of it paid for by the government. This brings the payback time for a standard system down a lot. The estimates I've seen are between one and a half years and five years. Even at five years, that's still 20% return per year, which is really good for an investment. On rare peaks of high solar and low demand, rooftop solar has actually exceeded the total amount of power needed by the grid. Because of this, solar panels installed after September 2020 have had to have a little switch in them that allows your power company to disconnect them from the grid to stop over-generation events like this from causing problems. Rooftop solar has been a big contributor to the grid, but it's also something that you've seen across a lot of other Australian states. So what's different about here? The rest of the renewable generations come from wind and big grid-scale solar. Wind went from nothing in 2005 to providing 45% of the state's power in 2024, which was the highest percentage of any single power source. And roughly 7% is provided by grid-scale solar plants. There's a huge amount of solar and wind plants that have been built in that time period. Solar and wind are both very weather-dependent power sources, so you need something else to fill up when there are gaps. The NEM cable definitely helps with this, but it can't be the whole solution. Currently, South Australia uses their remaining gas plants to fill up the generation when renewables aren't doing it. This is why gas is still about 25% of energy generated per year. However, South Australia are moving away from gas towards storage. There are three key things to consider with an energy storage system. Number one, capacity. Capacity is pretty self-explanatory. It's the amount that the storage system can store. Number two, dispatch. Dispatch is the speed that you can release that storage. It's not a lot of use having a huge amount of storage if you can only release it very, very slowly. And three, efficiency. The amount of power you get out for the amount of power you put in. There's no perfectly efficient storage system, but some are definitely better than others. One way storage can be done is with pumped hydro. When you pump a bunch of water up to the top of a hill, and then you let it fall through a hydroelectric plant. This is relatively efficient and get a huge capacity, but South Australia just does not have the geography for it. They did have a proposal to do a seawater pumped hydro, which is not something I'd even heard about before, but it seems this has been shelved. You can also do what New Zealand does and use regular hydro lakes as storage, but one look at the amount of hydro in South Australia removes that as an option. Some people also think you should use hydrogen. But the efficiency of hydrogen is only about 40 to 50 percent, so you're getting back only about 40 or 50 percent of the power you put in. South Australia do have some hydrogen projects planned, but as far as I can tell, they aren't planning to do storage with hydrogen. The solution South Australia are building is chemical batteries. Chemical batteries have great dispatch. All of the ones in South Australia can empty themselves within two hours. One can even empty itself in 15 minutes. They also have really good efficiency of about 90%. Their drawback, however, is that it costs a lot to get the capacity. The price has been going down rapidly, but because you're not generating power, you're just buying and reselling it, there's not a lot of profit to be made with them directly. Chemical batteries started in South Australia with this, the Hornsdale Power Reserve. It was built by Tesla next to the Hornsdale Wind Farm in 2017 under a built-in 100 days or it's free clause, which should honestly be a thing in more contracts. It was the biggest battery in the world for four years, and since then, two other wind farms have had grid-scale batteries built next to them, and there's been a 250 megawatt hour one built in Adelaide. South Australia still needs a good bit more battery storage before they can move off gas, but they're aiming to be 100% renewable by the year 2027. The other way South Australia was getting storage is with home batteries. Just like solar, you can get state money to help you buy a home battery. 
This gives your house protection against a blackout, and in theory at least, it also gives the state more storage capacity. This is generally done through something called a virtual power plant, or a VPP. These are where a large group of people, all with home batteries and normally with solar setups as well, get together and act as a single power plant. This helps because the energy system is built around large power plants. South Australia has had two of the world's biggest virtual power plants in it. One run by Tesla, which was opened in 2020, which Tesla are now selling. One run by AGL, which was opened in 2016, making it one of the earliest virtual power plants in the world. These aren't significant contributors to the grid, at least not yet, but there's been a test bed for this technology. So that's what's been done in South Australia. Now we need to look at what the effect of all that has been. One way to measure power price is the spot price. This is the price that your power company will pay for power that it needs now. Compared to other NEM states, South Australia's spot price is on the higher end, but it's not significantly higher than other states. It has high peaks, but so do the other states. The other power price, and the probably more important one, is the price the average end user will be paying for your power. This is more expensive in South Australia than in every other state in Australia. Power prices in Australia are often regulated by what's called a default market offer, or in Victoria, the Victorian default offer, because Victorians just like to be different. This is a government regulated maximum price that you can charge people for power. These are normally done by a distributor. South Australia's only distributor, the three distributors in New South Wales, and the distributor for the populated bits of Queensland are all regulated together by the Australian Energy Regulator. The price for South Australia is higher than the populated bits of New South Wales and Queensland, but lower than the rural bits of New South Wales. Most of the costs accounted for in the default market offer so are pretty similar between all the distributors but there's two that stand out as big differences. One of them is network costs. South Australia has to distribute power to all the rural properties, which are pretty sparse, and you have to put a lot of wires to get to a relatively small number of customers. This is why the price in rural New South Wales is so high. But the distributor also delivers power to the city, where you can get a lot of customers with a lot less infrastructure. This is where the urban bits of Queensland and New South Wales are much cheaper. The other one is generation costs. But if the spot price is the same, how can the generation cost be any different? The spot market isn't the only way retailers buy power. They also buy power from generators in contracts. This is vastly more complicated than I'm gonna get into here, but at the very, very basics, the generator commits to producing a certain amount of power and the retailer buys that at a certain price. This will be lowest costs for both parties and lowest risk for both parties. The intermittency of wind and solar, however, make it impossible to predict accurately how much power you're gonna be generating in the future, making these kind of contracts harder and when they are available, much more expensive. South Australian retailers don't seem to buy a lot of power this week, so they have to rely on the spot market more, which can increase costs significantly as you're not getting the discount of having that contract. The numbers in these contracts are private, but the Australian energy regulator have got on those private numbers and use them in this report. So that explains why the default market offer has this difference in generation. All of this basically means that buying energy now is a pretty similar price to other states, but buying energy in the future is more expensive than other states. It's possible, if not probable, that this cost will go down once South Australia is exporting more power to other states and once the remaining gas plants are shut down. But that doesn't change the fact that right now power is more expensive in South Australia and intermittent renewables are one of the bigger causes of that. So that's power price. What about the cost to the government? According to the South Australian government, the total cost of this transition so far in investment has been $6 billion. As far as I can tell, none of that money actually came directly from the government. There's probably tax inventives or stuff like that, but I couldn't track this down. This is probably me not knowing how to track that stuff down rather than it not actually happening. At the very least, it does not seem to have cost the government a significant amount of money. For context, the NEM three newest coal plants, all in Queensland, which could at full tilt power South Australia fully on most days, cost a combined total of about $4 billion to build. That is, not accounting for inflation, not accounting for a difference in maintenance costs, not accounting for difference in staffing costs, and also not accounting for the cost of coal. So six billion for a grid that is much cheaper and was built later does not seem like too bad of a deal. And the last metric I think is important is grid stability. Like, is the grid still stable? There have been a bunch of significant blackouts since the renewable transition began. The biggest of which, and the only statewide one, happened in 2016, when a storm cut off three of the four transmission lines heading into Adelaide. Almost all of the smaller blackouts have also been mostly caused by a transmission line issue. There was one, however, that didn't have this. When it was dropping off sooner than expected, and the only gas plant the state could call to turn on would take four hours to spin up. A 100 megawatt cut was authorized due to a system fault, a 300 megawatt cut ended up happening. This caused a blackout for about 90,000 people. I think this shows the inflexibility and variability of solar and wind can be a compounding factor that makes blackouts more likely. And while it's not the sole cause of any one blackout, it is often a contributing factor that makes blackouts worse. Since a particularly bad streak of these blackouts from 2015 to 2017, South Australia has been improving their blackout resistance a lot. Partially just by managing the grid better, partially by just building a lot more generation, and a big part from the introduction of batteries, first of which was installed at the end of this streak, which is probably one of the reasons it stopped. Batteries are definitely one of the best things for blackout prevention, because you can smooth out surprise drops when something like a transmission line goes down before you can get something else running. All this to say that variable intermittent renewables can be a factor that makes blackouts more likely. But it's not the only thing, and you can work around them. 
These days, South Australia has the most resilient grid to things like transmission line failures out of all of the NEM states, even as a lot of the other NEM states are still reliant on coal. This isn't saying that blackouts are impossible in South Australia or anything like that, but it's saying at the very least, a renewable power-based grid does not make it inherently less stable than other grids that are reliant on other technologies. So, what is there to learn from South Australia? For similar places like other Australian states, there is a lot to learn. You can pretty much copy them. For other places like New Zealand, there is a lot less you can learn. But this is kind of broad stuff that I think is important. Firstly, this graph is super scary. The vast majority of sources are variable power sources. South Australia is still reliant on gas pretty much every single night. Batteries have proved themselves capable of taking the peak off of that but you need a lot more storage to replace the gas completely. South Australia's plan for this is to build loads more renewables and loads more batteries to eventually take themselves off of gas. This will probably work for them, but it won't work for everybody, so you need some kind of plan to deal with those gaps. Basically, battery storage is really important, and until you get there, you need something else. Another thing to learn is that despite them being really cheap to build, renewables can cause higher prices to consumers, at least during the transition. We probably shouldn't be expecting to keep prices the same whilst actively transitioning all of our generation, but that should definitely be the goal. Another thing is this stuff happens fast. A lot of this video is going to be kind of out of date, or at least close to being out of date by the time this video actually goes out. For example, the new default market offer might already be out by the time you see this. I'll try and put a list of stuff in the comments. This is a smaller thing, but rooftop solar could be a great investment. If you own a roof and can afford to eat the installation cost, it is pretty damn good. If you do in your house, I would recommend getting at least a solar quote, especially if you live in a region with government incentives and or very high amounts of sun. And the last thing is that this is possible. This is something you can do. As the price of renewables trend downwards and downwards, this is going to make sense in more and more places, not just the really sunny and windy places like South Australia. Long-term thinking, they've got South Australia here, is probably going to massively pay off for them in the future. So yeah, it's possible. This is a thing that you can do. And that just beats a lot of arguments that say that it isn't. South Australia are aiming to generate 100% of their demand with renewables by 2027. And by 2050, they're aiming to produce five times more power than they can use from renewables. That would mean it becomes a massive exporter to New South Wales and Victoria, which will be a really interesting thing to see play out. This is obviously all talk at the moment, but they have $20 billion of projects in the pipeline, and they do have the track record to achieve something like this. Some of you may have noticed I didn't mention climate change once in this video, and that's because it's not really relevant to this stuff anymore. This stuff is being driven mostly by costs not really by climate. We're honestly really lucky that the cheapest solution also happens to be one that's good for the climate. I don't think there would be a large-scale energy transition without that. Thanks for watching, everyone. Um, this is my first video not on New Zealand, so there's probably a higher chance I got something wrong. Please let me know of anything in the comments. Uh, my next video will be back in New Zealand and a little bit different. Baby, your time is up.